they had moved from going from museums. So you had museums, you can have people come there, but that's very limiting. Then they had those vans. But we talked about the cost of vans and how do you fund them. Can you, do you fund them just going by going to people like you? But also, should you put some advertising on it? Okay, so you're thinking about how do you make this easier? And then there was the next step, which was the, the motorcycle and a, and, a, and a lab in a box. So that transition uh, took place over a period of years. Yeah, about 10 years. See, what uh, the biggest uh, challenge, like good that you mentioned about Ramji's, uh, one thing about Ramji is that he gives personal attention to things uh, in many ways. And what we could uh, always harness the power of community in getting and gaining suggestions from the community to expand. So this was the need of the hour where a lot of requests were coming across, especially government uh, from government agencies, that uh, there's a lot of remote areas where this requirement is very much there. And you guys uh, should come and look at it. And many of those areas we cannot reach with vans. So there's a there's a dire need of uh, us reaching out using some other methods. That's one suggestion came up uh, from the government key, one of our key partners. Another suggestion again from our donors and uh, uh, the, the government again is that what is a follow up? Like how will you follow up among teachers? What you guys will teach and go? Then what is a follow up? So that's where when we invented this uh, lab in a box idea where. Is a library system of uh, models where we distribute amongst schools and these teachers will teach it for about 20 days and then they circulate uh, a different set of box where supply. So this, uh, we could always innovate. Innovation is a key term which I would like to mention here. We could always innovate based on the need of the community. So we need to be in touch with the grassroots. We cannot sit in Bangalore office all the time. All of us have to travel into the grassroots and many a times we are we are reaching places where there are no proper internet connections and emails were not answered uh, at the proper time. But I cannot help it because we are in India where you know we have to reach to the grassroots. Maybe this is a good time to actually bring the perspective from the government since as you mentioned it is absolutely key. Uh, it has been key in your operations and in terms of wider impacts on society they are obviously the, the big player. Uh, so, Mr. Mossi, would like to comment on what you've seen about Agastya about uh, primary education, uh, you being in charge of uh, uh, all the way up to grade 10 and all of Karnataka. Thank you, Shishir. Uh, uh, just uh, you have seen the Agastya Foundation, what was activities they are doing in Karnataka. And I think the uh, government of Karnataka with the lab in the box uh, and science centers and teachers to program. I think we are partnering with it and every year I think almost 5 to 6 crore is in the I think lab in box itself so we are funding from government of Karnataka because ultimately uh, we are not very much keen on cities even rural areas also like recently we have started like uh, uh, Kani Dandolan with Akshara Foundation so we are thinking that uh, a backward district of uh, northern Karnataka like 6 7 districts like people they should be aware that uh, uh, how to improve because uh, normally we say everybody can claim that okay we are these people are bad but how to involve the children and that will be in a large area, backward area because they are, they are the first generation learners because the parents they are not very really literate so it becomes difficult for them so if you are talking about uh, uh, primary education itself I think more than 15 lakh children are there 9 to 10, some, uh, I think uh, 18 to 19 lakh children are there and for them it's a crucial one is the base and again they are coming to at this age of uh, 9 and 10 so uh, we, we have been focusing in government Karnataka. I think uh, you name any NGOs, we are working with them and across the service. So I think that's what uh, I can say and maybe I should say so much. Raji, do you want to uh, give us your perspective? Uh, tell us a little bit about what you do and uh, how, how you can kind of advise and support organizations such as Agastya. So, uh, I uh, think with Kakshan, we are the family foundation of the Devils, Michael and Sinjin, much like uh, our host, uh, Nish Pandey Foundation. And uh, the topic that, you know, of the conference and you know, this particular panel is very interesting for us because, you know, this has literally been our own approach in terms of, in terms of scaling, right? Scaling by proving. And, uh, and the word proving over there is very important because what do you prove before you scale and what do you keep proving as you're scaling, right? Because the challenges at both the scaling are very different. So one of the things which we have kept very fundamental towards proving is uh, we, 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 we work in education. So one of the fundamental things towards proving before uh, scaling is uh, impact on children's learning levels. And we've been extremely diligent, very rigorous about, uh, about measure, measurement of impact and proving impact that it can be attained as the program scales. And, uh, and uh, you know, that has served us very well in terms of 
in terms of you know not just meeting all the challenges that you know we are talking about in terms of you know government schools or even in private schools as they scale. So two or three examples you know where we work both with the government sector as well as with the private sector before scaling. So um, one example closer home to Edel give also is that of Mumbai school transformation where we are funding the city of Mumbai for the transformation of all 1500 schools in Mumbai, learning levels being as low as most uh, other education systems in India. And the design approach that was put together was very much based on impact again. So there were two or three uh, design partners which were brought in to redesign the classroom pedagogy, the leadership training, Save the Children in India, Nandi Foundation and Kavali Education Foundation. And all of these are organizations with whom we work much through the stages when they are running either after school programs or running small pilots. Uh, uh, Vidya is familiar with some of these programs, in, you know, working uh, in after school programs up in Mumbai. And the approach during those days was very much that, you know, if you take a child from a certain learning level, you know, how long does it take you to get, to get that child to his or her grade level competency and how can you measure it and how do you prove it? And when these programs were then, you know, the city of Mumbai together ran a you know, selection mechanism to see which were the programs which could actually come and improve the learning levels in their schools. And these were the programs which were at least coming with that strong foundation that at least in a clean environment or even a, in a clean uh, lab sort of a setup, they can deliver the impact. So I think that's, you know, as they've scaled, there are multiple challenges of how do you integrate it within the government school system, how do you monitor them. A program working at a 30 school level is very different from that working at a school level but uh, at least you know you never go back and rethink the basic thing that you know, the foundation of impact is there so that's one example where I think you're know, just having proven before scaling and you know and keeping that rigor of measurement throughout the program is important the other one is actually very closer home to um, to Karnataka is a company that we've invested in in Bangalore called Edutel uh, it uh, runs uh, satellite based education programs is today uh, running in 1,000 schools in, uh, in rural Karnataka is, uh, is, a, is a program in which I am Bangalore actually played a very strong role where before they uh, before the program was actually scaled they were running a small pilot in 14 schools in rural Karnataka where, uh, where again the focus was that would our children learning better as a result of this program? You know, and, where, and where are they not learning? What changes do we need to bring about in our program as, uh, as to do that? What do third party measurements say? What do board exam results say? And having proven that, then taking the program to scale. And then monitoring again, very different things. So he's still, you know, Edutel is still monitoring, you know, how are they doing in their board 10 exams? How are the kids doing in CET exams? They're doing a pre and post test before every class to determine whether or not uh, the children are learning. But at the same time, you know, this is taking them to a higher level of uh, impact versus just going and questioning, you know, when the program is at a thousand school level that whether or not this program can deliver impact. So one of the learnings which is, you know, which, is, which we've proven again and again from, uh, from our experience is that if we are very, very diligent about impact before we scale, and we keep that trigger as we scale, because, you know, as we scale, we, we worry about capacity, we worry about management talent, we worry about monitoring, and all of those things become even more important, but if the bedrock of all our scaling up remains, you know, remains true to delivering impact, improving children's learning levels, we, you know, we are, we are on a good path there. So I imagine, Vidya, you must be also similarly looking at experiments and trying to prove and measure impact before you kind of go the whole hog in terms of the support for an organization. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the size that we start with itself it makes it necessary to ensure that the provability of, uh, of, of the project is kind of established before we go on um, and push uh, expansion or, or scaling. Uh, one of the examples, a very good example of collaboration where the Dell Foundation and ADC have worked very closely is an organization called Masoom, which uh, you know began working with night schools in Mumbai, where basically working um, adults upwards of uh, 16 and 18, they come to school in the evening, you know, at between 7 and 10. And this was a program that we seeded in 2008 uh, and grew it to about uh, 10 schools um, and you know we really wanted to scale that program and that's when the Dell Foundation really came in. Um, we together conducted a, a fairly long study to ensure that the program had established uh, its metrics in terms of impact, in terms of what it was measuring, how it was measuring it, 
and then Foundation I must say was an excellent partner in, in, in really in pushing us to work through it. Um, and, and today we are in 30 schools and we're, we've already built a plan to go to 150 schools. But this is a very good example of, of partnership and working around proving. So somebody at the lower end needs to work around pushing the pilot into proven stage and then taking it forward with, uh, with you know, sort of uh, more qualified donors. This might be a good time to get uh, invite Ashwini Ranjan, who is from uh, Pratham Mysore, uh, to give us his experience of an NGO working on the ground and that in which the whole sort of things we're talking about. So, so this uh, slightly off the plan that I had, I thought I quickly uh, introduce yeah, myself. Yeah, please introduce yourself and of take a few minutes. What that I do? Yeah, so. Can I just to make sure that I don't deviate? Can I have a slide, please? Uh, I'm sure uh, you have uh, heard of uh, Pratham, and uh, we are uh, basically in uh, 19 states, and Pratham Mysore is the Karnataka chapter. And uh, we were also recently in the news when we released uh, the Asar report. Uh, which we have been doing uh, for the past 10 years and uh, this this is a survey across the country where uh, mm -hmm. we uh, survey across all the states uh, um, 16,500 uh, villages 25,000 uh, volunteers get involved and uh, in a matter of 100 days uh, we measure the learning levels and uh, uh, that, uh, okay, the, the Mysore chapter, we, we were involved in uh, the survey in Karnataka. Now quickly, uh, our primary focus is on uh, primary and secondary education in the government schools. Our mission statement, of course, is every child in school and learning well. Uh, now every child in school, I think, uh, thanks to the government uh, government's efforts, we have more than 98% of the child population in the schools. And uh, my compliments to Mr. Moshin. Uh, I know his efforts to get more and more children into the school. And uh, we function through collaborations with government, local communities, parents, teachers, volunteers, etc. Our program is definitely to supplement the efforts of the government and not to replace it. Uh, so all our models are scalable models. We keep uh, scale. Uh, as our primary focus and we try to develop models which are possible to do that and we work in about 450 village schools and uh, we have 200 libraries. Our experience is 12 years hands on at the, at the ground level and uh, uh, we at Pratham Mysore take pride in saying that it may not be wrong to call ourselves a laboratory, continuously innovating new approaches to learning and make sure that uh, the return of investment is at the maximum. Ashwini, uh, maybe this is on your second slide, but since you, this is your last point you just made, can you give us an example of uh, an experiment you carried out and you, you came up with an innovation and we, you implemented it and how beneficial it was or what the challenges were? Uh, now, uh, one of the things that come to my mind, which I thought uh, I could share with you, is we have a, a, a program called the Read India program. Now, uh, what has happened is the survey has thrown up a number of gaps. You see, the gaps start from standard one, and it goes on till standard eight, where there is a continuous drop in learning. Once there is a gap from one and two, now what we achieve from 2 and 3 is lost. That, that certain amount of effort is lost when the child moves from 1 to 2, 2 and 3. And if there is a there is a lack of learning at class 1, then what we all the efforts at class 2 becomes a waste. So this continuously when we reach uh, class 8, we find, and I am sure many of you who have read the report, that in an 8 standard child, uh, let me say, eight standard child, uh, all of them cannot read a standard two text. As much as 25% of the standard eight child cannot read a standard two level lesson. 
50% cannot uh, do a simple math or a division subtraction at of the standard two. So now this is this was a kind of a big concern for us. And what we thought was that uh, we will we will conduct a program for accelerated learning. So what we did was we, we I'm sure uh, uh, Mr. Motion knows about our effort. We went to the government schools. We segregated children depending upon their learning levels, maybe in the word level, sentence level, para level, story level. We, uh, we uh, segregated them and then what we did was we took them on one on one and we conducted camps spread over 30 days addressing the requirements of each segment depending upon their learning levels. Now please believe me, in 30 days time spread over three months we were able to bring them up to the appropriate level of learning so now this is a, 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 a we have got a proven model which is possible to scale up and in, in fact this is one of the uh, major programs of Pratham across the country where we are working in, in almost uh, uh, five lakh uh, village schools so this could be further scaled up before we do anything else, tinkering with our education system. Mr. Sanjan, I appreciate the work of uh, uh, the, the survey every year uh, you do it. And uh, I do good through it, whatever we can do the course collection, whatever we have, uh, is possible from our government sector. But just clarification, because what happened that uh, when we see the media reports, here also you are showing that uh, you are only doing for the common schools. But what happens if it becomes a negative impact on common schools? Because you want to improve the condition of common schools. But what happens that common public, see, people like us in the sitting in this room, we can appreciate the feeling that, okay, this may happen in this, any school. But what happens that if, as the media shows uh, your reports and uh, reporting, it shows that they are really batting the common schools. They, they are saying that they are bad. Don't admit your children in the school. So it becomes a counterproductive. That's what my feeling is there. I may be wrong. I'm, I'm just a, a, I'm a student of a education department. That's what I can say. Not as a commissioner. But I feel that it's a, it's a, hurts the common school because you said that your quality is bad. Don't add me to it. Sir, let me let me quickly uh, react to this. There are two things that I would like to say. Uh, uh, here I am not uh, uh, beating the horse, which we are working with. Uh, uh, I, since I work with the government schools, I am able to only tell you about government schools. Please uh, give me the, the uh, resource uh, available. We will also conduct a, a, a survey on uh, private schools. And uh, the study we have is, we don't say private schools are any better. So please uh, be reassured and feel comfortable that uh, uh, government schools are on par or with private schools, number one. Number two, uh, with the media, they can only, the, what makes news is negativity, okay? Uh, the negativity sells as far as the media is concerned. But please look at us. We are looking at the situation as glass half full. We are not saying that there is, uh, there is a, a, a crisis. But what our intention is from the beginning, it is always to see how we can set this uh, right, how the situation is right, and we are, uh, we want to be part of that. Right? But one complaint I am certainly going to make here is that NGO work needs to be given a little more uh, weightage, must be recognized, <coughs> and the government should see that there is value in NGO work uh, and make the best use of it. Uh, Mr. Ashwin, I can tell you, at least government of Karnataka, I think a lot of people in the uh, Anish is there, a lot of people are there. And we are open to ideas, I can tell you. If, if one person comes and uh, says that I want to improve the school, one of the schools in my neighborhood, we are ready to work with it and we are working on it. And if somebody, 100 people come and say that I am going to improve the 100 uh, in the round table conference or anybody, I am telling you, we are open to ideas. And any foundation, any NGO, you name it, any NGO in Karnataka, I can tell you with, in Karnataka itself, in Akshay Park, uh, the Bindabil scheme, we work more than 80 NGOs. Although government of nature that don't see, uh, give much work to NGOs, the school should be cooked in the schools. But still we are working almost 80 NGOs in just one scheme. 
and similarly we work on with you. So I appreciate. I don't uh, deny your or your uh, criticism. It's a, it's a perfect all day. I'm not saying that my schools are perfect. There's a lot of issues are there, but it's an issue of a scale. Because when you talk about primary schools only, it's a 40,000 schools, government. Some six to seven thousand government schools are there at a high secondary level. So this is the issue. So actually, uh, in 2000, uh, 2007, the National Knowledge Commission has come to our campus and uh, recommended to PM that uh, the Agastya model has to be replicated across India. And uh, thanks to Karnataka government, the Karnataka government is the first government to respond to that, uh, that, that particular report which has come out. Now that uh, we have envisioned the ecosystem where we will meet the entire children of Karnataka, and that has come true, actually, in the next uh, one year or two, uh, we'll be spreading out across Karnataka. We are coming up with five, uh, six campuses in Karnataka. One is coming up in Hospitalli. All thanks to, uh, this is the first ecosystem of that kind, which supports the uh, minds-on education with hands-on side, which is coming up in the country. And it's going to be an example for the country, which has been recommended to uh, the current education minister also. Um, <coughs> one one uh, quick word. Uh, Pratik Pratik believes that uh, if, if there is a game changer, it has to be at the primary level. And uh, uh, I, I think the importance given to this uh, up to class 5, uh, whether it is the teacher or the school or the school infrastructure, whatever it is, requires a little, uh, to revisit. Because if the foundation is right, I think the edifice also should be strong. We continuously find in our various surveys year after year, that the attention right now, uh, you know, we are we are so distressed that there are about 3,000 Anganwadis uh, who are uh, on the streets protesting. Now, if we believe that, uh, in fact, Pratham came into existence to fill a gap, to fill the need of a preschool education, we are strongly advocating that the the, the uh, though RTE encompasses children from 6 to 14 that is the uh, uh, up to standard eight, we are strongly advocating that there should be one year of preschool exposure so that the child is prepared to go to the, the first standard. There is a lot of loss in learning because of the shock that the child uh, uh, you know, uh, encounters when the, from, a, from a no exposure background. I'm talking of rural children, very poor children, where the children, uh, I mean the parents are illiterate and they have not been exposed to education themselves. So the child encounters such a shock that for nearly six months the child is not learning anything. So we are advocating that there should be at least one year of exposure, uh, preschool exposure, so that the investment that we are making into uh, the education from standard one, uh, there is a return on investment. So therefore, uh, since uh, the, the representative of the government is here, we would like to prove to them that the, the, the so many sh uh, pitfalls, shortfalls, uh, the lacuna, the, sh the, the shortcomings that are there from class of, uh, 1 to class 5 could be remedied. Nothing, nothing has gone beyond repair. But a little tweaking in policy, a little tweaking in priorities is going to make a lot of change in, in our uh, quality of education. I'm happy that uh I would like to uh, inform the audience and the uh, senior agenda. I'm happy that we are in the same boat because that's what I can tell you. Last year, we gave the proposal to the government that all government schools, primary schools, they should have LKG classes and pre nursery classes to fill that gap. But unfortunately, what happened that, again, school, question of scalability. Because if I say that primary schools also, that, that difference is 22,000. So if one to start the pre schools, 22,000 schools. We have done uh, some experimental basis on some district class and uh, schools. Uh, some schools, uh, local DPIs, local officials, they have taken initiative. They have started uh, pre nursery classes in the primary schools. But as a whole, as a scheme, uh, last year we sent a proposal to government, but again, finance said at home. We don't have that to worry. Thank you for that. I think uh, we have some comments from the uh, funders. So I was just. Um, Comment that was being made about you know uh, NGOs and all 
so about you know, the comment that you made that, you know, the, the challenge that you have at hand is always skills. I mean, I think that you know, uh, when, when we are thinking about how about our government school system, we have to think about strengthening what exists and not creating parallel education systems, right? So while NGOs bring in great strengths and we support both for profits and for profits, I think that bring in a great strength in terms of being able to have the flexibility of research, of being able to develop something outside and then bring it into the school. But I think always doing it with the objective of strengthening the government school system or you know there's a there's a booming private school system and you know that too needs a lot of improvement and you know there's a market which is willing to stay over there but coming back to the topic that we're discussing on government school system i strongly feel that you know the approach that we should have as uh, developmental organizations as on for profit is to say what is it that you know we can leverage in an existing government school system and plenty of things right i mean there's beautiful infrastructure you know there are a lot of resources in terms of just budgets and manpower that are allocated to our schools and you know we we are becoming more and more aware of you know what are the gaps and how they need to fill in so to take that approach that we have to work as a, as a partner with the government in terms of just improving what we already have and you know how is and you know as a partner which is you know which is bringing in a you know a very different approach you know why has some everything that existed within the government school system not worked i mean why are our teachers were not who are equally qualified not being able to deliver you know do they need different tools do they need you know a very different uh, pedagogical approach or just a very different monitoring approach and i think that's a mindset with which you know with which if government and not for profits were working together would actually result in improving the learning outcomes of children instead of trying to create parallel education this might be a good time to actually begin to open it up to some questions from the audience and then uh, we can continue our discussion among ourselves as well. Yep. Uh, since we have been hearing about conflict of interest for the last few years, a few months, since uh, we have been hearing about conflict of interest in the news for quite a few months, PCCI and Srinivasan, wouldn't it be conflict of interest when an organization undertakes survey and finds out problems and then comes out to solve the problem. Pratham, for the last eight years, has been coming out with Tassa and uh, then you only survey government schools, we have no indicators on private schools and then offer the government a uh, way out to improve problems in the government school. Now, one of the major issues for NGOs working in the sector is that the morale of teachers are very low in government schools simply because day in and day out they are told that they are not doing well. In fact, if you were to just do a sample survey of private schools and government schools, you would notice that private schools are no better than government schools and government schools are much better in some places. For example, it is proved by the Pro and EI survey. Yes, it is already proved by EI. Actually, EI survey in Hubli. Yes, can we? Can we? Uh, yeah, and uh, the other one is if you look at SSLC results, that's the only indicator where you can look at private schools and government schools. You will find out of the 34 uh, educational districts in Karnataka, more than 25 districts in Karnataka, the SSLC results are just about one percentage difference between private school and high schools. And in place like Kalgatki, which is part of uh, a rural part of Hubli, you will find that Kalgatki high schools which are large numbers, then compared to private schools, large numbers. Population of high school students in government schools are larger than uh, private schools, yet the percentage point as an advantage to government schools are 5% higher. They show 93% results and they show only 88 to 83% results. Sure. And get, so... You get the point, let's uh, get a response. Um, now, if I, if I may attempt an answer here, all of us ben benefit in measurements. We, we need to know who is doing what. Government school constitutes 70% of the schooling system in India. And uh, I, I have encountered uh, a similar question, especially when we go to the rural schools and uh, the teachers say, why do you say that we are, we are bad? Why do you say that we are not performing well? And uh, so now the answer, the answer to that is once again depending upon how you want to look at it. Now you, 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 I asked 
that uh, teacher, where does your child study? And he says, my child goes to a convent. I said, why, why not in your own school? And he says, convents are better. I said, have you tried? Have you tested the child? He said, no. Uh, what made you send the child? He wears a good uniform. Uh, he says, good morning to me in the morning. And, uh, 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 and uh, then he has colorful textbooks. Then uh, he goes in a, in a bus. And my neighborhood thinks, that he is going to a better school and that as a parent that I am showing greater uh, attention to my children. Now this was his explanation. Now it looks like where government schools are not in a good light is because they are not giving publicity to the good work that they are doing. One of the teachers said, we, we uh, uh, all the uh, SSLC children passed, there was a 100% result. Sir, there was no reporting in the press. Now, why was it not reported, sir? You are not building the brand. Please celebrate success. Please um, uh, show that there are islands of excellence even in government schools. Now, if you are not going to expose this, then the government schools will all continue to be looked at in a poor light. And what Pratham is doing is, Pratham is trying to um, uh, do a third party audit and saying, look, you can do better and whatever billions of rupees that are being invested in the education system, you can get a better quality in return. I'd just like to make a couple of observations. I think that it's not just in India, but in many countries, there's always this debate about the private and the public <laughs> education system. Uh, in, in the US, for example, uh, there was a while when people thought charter schools, which use government funds but have a separate charter, uh, would do much better than the public school system. It turns out that among charter schools too, there's a big variation. There are some who are uh, doing extremely well and some who are not doing so well. And the key is to figure out why do those that do well actually turn out doing well? And is that scalable? I think scalability also is a question there. So here it's very clear from what you're saying and the audience is saying that there are a whole bunch of private schools and there also is tremendous variation in the quality. Some of us may have been fortunate to go to a great government school, some of us fortunate to go to a lousy government school. Similarly, some of us are fortunate to go to a great private school. But you go to villages now and you and I can see what you're saying. They put up a little, they say Montessori, it's not a Montessori school. They, they, have, they have nice uniforms, they have a bus taking you from village to village. And the poor parent who might be illiterate himself or herself has no clue about the quality of education. So there's a tremendous variation in private schools. So. So I don't think we'll solve that problem today, but I think the important thing is, uh, I think it's remarkable that government is being represented on this panel, that you're, you're opening up and to come here and uh, discuss these things. And we have evidence of government actually supporting several programs. And this is how you actually move things, you move things forward. You discuss which are the things that are working, which are the challenges, and then you try to kind of figure out. Uh, do you have anything to add uh, to that? Uh, if, if, uh, if you may, permit uh, let, me, me. let me just get a comment from, um, um, See, the, for the, I think if you think of a quality, uh, see, that's what I've, uh, just I'll add on to uh, what the discussion has took place. See, we do have a like, Karnataka State Quality Council. And we do, we do survey of uh, common schools, private schools, aided schools. But I can tell you, like, uh, since there's a common schools, I can pass an order that, okay, whatever the random sampling, we do it, we do it. Aided schools, we give the money. They're also not willing to come. Private schools, uh, I'm telling you, say, for each school survey, it costs me 25,000 rupees. But private schools, I'll say that I'll give you concession 50%. Give me some 12,000 rupees. Come for the certification from us. Because we are going to assess your academy excellence, leadership qualities, innovative, innovation, whatever things are there. But they don't come. Because they, they, because they face that if I come, if I make it open, everything, their bubble will burst. Why, why can't you keep that into so government schools? schools. We're, doing, we're doing it to government schools. How about the scaling? Uh, last year, around 200 schools we have done it. It's a detailed survey. We, we, some of our, our own staff is there, and some of them are we are taken from outside also. Outside You are giving a certification for the government schools? Yeah, yeah. For every, everybody who has participated in it, uh, two and a half thousand schools. This year we have a target of 4,000 schools. We are working on it. There is a question that they need there. So, um, I'm not part of ASAR, but as far as I, I've uh, looked at that data, uh, even the recent report, 
for as far as I understand, uh, Asar tests are done on private and government yeah, schools yeah, yeah. in rural dis districts. So it is, um, uh, and then that is one point. Uh, secondly, um, there are studies that have shown that when you control for a lot of other factors like education of parents, income, etc., etc., the difference between private and public schools is very minimal. And one of the points that I think we are ignoring here for the movement of uh, parents, I mean parents taking their parents out of, uh, their children out of government schools and putting them into uh, private schools is the, uh, the impression that, the, uh, that uh, English education is a uh, necessity in today's world. And uh, a lot of, if you look at even government data and statistics, there's, I, I think, I forget now, something like 3 to 7 percent movement uh, to English medium schools, uh, you know, uh, every year. So um, that is a factor. It is not necessary. Of course, the impression that government, uh, private schools are better than government schools exists. Uh, but uh, Asar test uh, is done on both private and government schools and rural districts. They don't go on schools. They don't want to come in. But, uh, students of both private and government schools. Madam, and, uh, but uh, it never comes out in public that uh, when the survey has been done and what's the qualification. That's an excellent point. We're not here to debate government versus private. Let's get back to the point which is. Yes, we, uh, we heard that, ma'am. We are shifting back. Thank you for reminding us. So we're coming back to the topic of scaling by proving and the challenges that exist. So is there any question about that? Let's take that. So yeah, uh, my question is for Ajit first and then to Mr. Uh, Mohsin. Um, see the current assessment protocols, basically they do not really test conceptual understanding or creativity which is where the focus as far as Agastya is concerned. So in terms of your own proving, and I'm coming back to the uh, main theme, uh, have you been able to actually, num number one, build the data so that, let us say, the government can look at that as, a, an, as an actual outcome? And taking forward from that, let us say, if my follow-up question to Mr. Mohsin is, uh, suppose that proving is done, you know, how quick or how slow has the government been in adopting and paying for it? I do not, you know, right now we are talking about many other people paying and government giving permission for them to operate. So I, just the two questions. Yeah, actually we, uh, our key mission is to spark curiosity and nurture creativity. That's our key mission. Leading to leadership at the long level, longer, longer uh, time period. So what we have done is, of course we have developing the, and creating and keeping the data. And we also emphasize quite a bit on uh, creating caselets uh, by third-party evaluation model, which means uh, third-party, uh, that there's a qualitative research done and uh, three books have already been published. Emmachi Adi has come down and did a study on us, which has been submitted to the government of Karnataka. Then we also are now uh, developing, in the progress of, process of developing a model with IIM uh, Bangalore, and the team is looking at that and they're developing it, which is going to be a nationwide deployment. And as per the new CSR law, we are supposed to create a third-party evaluation model, which we are partnering with few other organizations like CMS and all that and developing that. And that one study we have already completed in Bhopal and another one is coming up in Meghalaya. So by mid-next this year, we'll have a, a country-wide deployment model where, uh, and what, what we feel more most effective is to develop this case lens where the researcher goes into the child's home and the environment and understand what happened to that child over a period of say five years. So these kind of studies are proving out to be more, uh, you know, in, in the story form and uh, proving out to be more uh, impressive and, and, and getting the right kind of results. It's just a little bit, uh, but it is very different from the current as a standardized protocol. You know, exactly. In fact, it may or may not have any impact on the 10th standard marks. Yeah. No, no, we a lot of learning may have happened, yeah. Yeah. but its impact on the 10th standard marks may not be. We don't look at the so how, how would the government then perceive that? Because know, of, so when we go to the government, we say our mission statement is to supplement the system while, while creating the research attitude in the child. So we are only looking at that measurement. Like you said, it's very difficult to create that indicator and, and measure that indicator. That's why we have been talking to many, many organizations. JPIP Pune was there. Looking at the, uh, looking at a different model, uh, McKinsey has come down and looked at a model. 
So this is a very difficult uh, thing to, because look, you know, we're looking at many models including tests like Torres test from abroad. Uh, so it's, by end of this year, we'll have a very comprehensive answer, that's what we believe actually. Already we've done some studies and I can share with you the books which we've already published. You know, we all agree that this children's education is a multifaceted problem and issue. We can take lots of perspectives on it. And uh, I would like to hear and get a peek from the funding agency's perspective as to how you assign priorities. And that includes you, Sushil, as well. Sushil, Vidya, and Prachi. Uh, when you take decisions, and you represent Desh Pandey Foundation to some extent here on the board. So Sushil, you may have some comment about that. So when you take decisions about funding of a proposal or a project related to children's issues, how do you assign priority? Just to give you an example, you can look at that at the acquisition level, you know, to get kids into school. And I guess uh, Akshay Patra would be an example of it. Their approach to getting kids into school by providing lunches and so on. You can also focus on retention issues. Once the kids are in school, how do you keep them going to school? So there might be proposals and programs developed toward that. And the third component would be enhancing of kids' education. And the discussion that's going around about private versus public education could be falling in that area. So just wanted to get your feel for it from your funding of foundations perspective. So maybe Rachi over there. Thank you. I'll just quickly give my two minutes on that. And depending on there would be no perfect science for a for a funding entity to decide, you know, what would be the, you know, what, you know, where they're getting the kids in, retaining them, or, you know, them being there and then learning, you know, out of those three, you know, which one comes first and which one should you spend your resources on. But just speaking about our foundation, we have decided to focus just on the learning of kids. So while enrollments are an issue and, you know, retaining kids is an issue, uh, our focus is only that, you know, once kids, you know, the programs that we're supporting or the organizations that we are investing in, they need to improve the learning levels of children, they need to improve it in a measurable way, and they need to get them to grade level competencies. And that's also very <coughs> fundamental to our investment, that it's not about getting kids to basic uh, you know, literacy and numeracy, which is also a big need in the country. But you know, amongst all of those, what we are focusing on, and, you know, and all our um, proposal evaluation helps, uh, you know, is held in that framework, that kids need to achieve, achieve their grade level competencies, which can be measured in a way. So for ADV also it's pretty much similar, it is about learning outcomes and when we started we did look a lot at access but we found that actually government infrastructure is, is, is pretty much there in, in the most uh, remote corner of the country. So looking at access uh, was not really about building infrastructure but figuring out how to get the kids into the school. But we found that when you start focusing on learning outcomes the kids start coming to school. So the access issue in a sense begins to get solved when they see their peers who are going to school and achieving uh, better learning. And the way we looked at learning outcomes also has been to, uh, in two ways. One is to work with organizations that directly impact learning in government schools, either through direct intervention or after school intervention. And the second is by focusing very strongly on teacher training organizations that, um, that focus really on, on building a teacher rather than saying things are wrong. But uh, uh, you know, building a teacher's uh, competence and confidence in managing classrooms. So those are the broadly the two kinds of organizations we focus on. Yeah. My my question is to uh, funding agencies. You know, uh, recent uh, report has uh, shown that the worst engaged generation is in the India. So my uh, question is, how do you scale up, and how do you look, uh, show your reports? to improving the rural youth. You know, there are so many youth who are lying in the villages because of not getting the job and because of the communication. So how about you all, like, you know, uh, steps in overcoming that uh, scarcity? Yeah, I think you're talking about rural livelihoods. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. Youth and youth development, I can say. And how about you all, you both? Uh, right. So there is, so in the, uh, I mean, my foundation looks at both education and livelihoods, and there is something in the middle which is around employability. Uh, it sort of sits right, you know, uh, in between these two broad sectors. Um, we focus uh, on the livelihood side. We're focusing on two broad issues. We're focusing on um, on migration and 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 the effects of migration not only on migrants but also on their families left behind. 
And the second broad area we focused on is financial inclusion in a non-profit model. Uh, and looking at not just credit, but also the availability of basic financial services, including pension, um, uh, insurance, and things like that. Because my parent, uh, our parent organization is, is a financial services organization, makes a lot of sense. And there's a huge connect between livelihoods and credit. I think we completely un underestimate that the building of entrepreneurship, the building of jobs in rural India cannot happen without the availability of credit. And that's one of the things we're focused on. But what's also important is the employability link, you know, between education and uh, and livelihoods. And one of the things we're trying to do in our education organizations is trying to complete the loop that children at the end of grade 10 or grade 8 also become employable and focusing part of the education on that. Hi. I think we have about five minutes left, uh, four or five minutes left. So what I'd like to do is uh, invite uh, Mr. Mawson to just take a minute or two and talk about what he sees from his perspective as a major challenge that comes in the way of scaling any important aspect of provision of education. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, see, what I feel that uh, after I'm here in the, this department almost one and a half years, this department, and as I, I told you that uh, we are talking about if I talk common schools only, only it's a 50,000 school. And out of uh, three pay one four children, almost 70% are basically served by the common schools. Either directly 50,000 schools or aided schools are there. But apart from that, I think basic problem, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Mr. Rajendra will agree with me that uh, what I feel that school is back, I was one of the panel of the uh, teachers education as uh, discussing some issue with them and I told them on face of it that see what I feel what are the half experience in this department that teachers education has somehow is two decades behind and everybody was kept silent so I think that uh, that thing is a correct because uh, they are experts uh, in the teachers education and that's what I think problem is there uh, and I told even uh, our union members also that see you are the weakest link because I have a executive committee of all the office players of that civil association. I told them, if I am thinking of a quality, quality starts with you. Because I can give you best of the program. But what is ultimate delivery in the classroom? That is important. Maybe you are taking care of the front benches, but what is the last person who is doing it? How is doing it? Whether he is actually consulting on the board also, or that is also a big question sometimes. Because he may have some health problems. He may, he may have a good uh, bad uh, eyesight or maybe uh, some hearing problem because some rural areas we don't uh, children will not be taken care of on those days. So I think that's the basically biggest challenge with us and teachers accountability. Uh, just now, uh, just uh, study I was in Delhi in Mechadi we had some discussion and we are now uh, we have agreed in principle that uh, in four districts of Karnataka we are going to start biometric attendance system on a pilot basis. So it's subject to government approval because we have said that we are ready. We want to put it there in the system so that everybody can be monitored. Whether it's a attendance is there or even midday with the scheme is there. We, we, want, we, we can have a, like a IVRS system that every school, how many uh, children are present there and how many are taking the midday with scheme or Shira Bhagya milk is there. So I think this issue is basic major problem is the teacher's education and their accountability. And I think that's why we, we are very much lagging behind. That's what I feel. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to request. Just take a minute to uh, yes. give you some. Uh, I agree with uh, Mr. Moshin that uh, the game changers are the teachers. Uh, I think so we have sufficient examples. Uh, if you, if you, people who have read about uh, Finland, Finland uh, the, the, was a phenomenal success when the teachers got involved. And I understand in Finland it is easier to become a, a doctor or an engineer, but uh, to become a private, uh, I mean a primary school teacher is extremely difficult. And the teachers are considered as national heroes. So, so what I'm trying to say is, it's the teachers who are going to be the game changers. But who is going to motivate the teachers to keep them on their toes? And it is the community. It is the parent. So, uh, in Pratham's uh, uh, various experiments, we have found that when we have concentrated on empowering the, 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 uh, the parent, 
for, for instance, asking the right questions, going to school, participating in the parent-teacher meetings, understanding what the report card is, demanding the report card. Now I understand that uh, the report card uh, is is not is in almost in non-existence. Even though the, the the rule says that there should be a comprehensive, continuous evaluation of the child, so the 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 uh, since the child, the parent is not demanding, then the teacher is bound to waver in his attention or quality. Uh, now, for instance, for instance, the government uh, uh, introduces any number of schemes uh, to promote the welfare of the child, but that scheme is not known. So the key is. The parents, parents' involvement, and the SDMC uh, alertness—all these are the supporting factors which can improve the performance of the teacher considerably. If I look at the challenges, the challenges are many. Biggest challenge which disturbs me a lot is uh, about 700 million youth are going to come by 2040. So all I have got next 15 to 20 years to educate them. So parenting is one area where government can bring in a lot of parent participation into the idea. If I look at a typical classroom, 45 minutes is a teacher got to teach the theory, do the activities. See, we have the best of the best curriculum, best of the best textbooks after 2005, uh, NCF 2005. Then the teacher has to go do another very, very unique thing called CCE, because she has to go and evaluate each and every child. So all has to happen in 45 minutes. So I'm not criticizing the time period available. What I'm saying, we have to find accelerated learning methods to effectively use that 45 minutes. So Agastya's methods are revolving around, mostly when we design curriculum the way we do it. We want to help the teacher to, to accelerate the learning process in the class. I've seen a teacher teaching. For a typical teacher, it takes about four days to teach a chap chapter. If he uses the right tools and methods and hands-on devices, she can teach it in four hours. The moment I see the strength of the child to learn, the whole equation shifts. So an accelerated learning mode, mode is very important for uh, India. We cannot design systems around our current situation. We have to look at the 2040 challenge which we are going to encounter. So it has to be designed for future. All our scale-up models, all what we are going to do is for the future, not for today. Today is pretty much we are running okay. I was just going to say that I actually don't think any silver bullets in education and you know just fixing our teacher education, yes, it's a very important point of view. I do think that, you know, when we look at our schools, uh, you know, we should look at them as just like any other management structure. We need to get, you know, the best technologies and empower our teachers with the right tools such that they're able to do it in the classrooms. But at the same time, multiple other things which all good education systems in the world have, having standardized assessments such that you actually know that teachers are, uh, that students are progressing and that they're progressing towards the right goal, not just for the teachers as tools or some continuous and comprehensive evaluation, but for the system to know that, you know, whether or not they're being able to achieve the objectives that they are. So, so I think, you know, enabling our teachers and our, uh, you know, training them and providing them with the right tools, but creating the parallel pillars of having standardized assessments, having appropriate monitoring mechanisms and accountability mechanisms, right? We have 50,000 schools, but we also then have an army of people who go, you know, the BRCs, the CRCs, the block education officers, you know, all of whose job is to go visit these schools. So if they were actually empowered with the right information and the right rules on what to go and observe and come back and report and flow all the way up to the leadership of the schools. So I think, you know, having the right assessment processes, having the right accountability and monitoring mechanisms in these schools and really very, very critical at a school level again is to have strong school leadership models such that, you know, just like any, every company runs with a CEO, every school runs with the school leader as a CEO. So there are multiple things on which I think, you know, there are, there are models which are now proving that they can actually lead to impact, you know, having, having you know, the government school system as well as the affordable private school system to come together and look at them as a system and take a more systemic, thoughtful approach is what is going to get us there and, you know, just, just one thing may not be able to just help us bridge the big gap that we have. Just, uh, 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 just uh, as you're talking about the teacher's education, the issues and problem is like, in Karnataka, if I take common secretaries, we have two and a half plus teachers. And it's a big political question that if you talk about assessment of teachers, it's very difficult. Nobody, no government can afford, that's what I can say. <laughs> For all. 
uh, we do have some assessment and this year I think we are doing self-evaluation because government of India they told us that uh, we have to do it. Uh, I think by I think this uh, month, I think uh, by another 10 15 days, we are going to complete the self-evaluation of the teachers. Because there we said that we are not going to take action. We would like to hear from you what is your qualification, what, what details are there, how you feel, if any learning gap is there between you, please you can give it so that we can formulate next policy. But we are not going to take any disciplinary action, but as a pure self-evaluation. That's called appendix. Yeah, that, that just we have, we have done it. Nowhere in the world actually are, you know, teachers, teachers penalized based on the outcomes of their children and, you know, it doesn't need to be done in India either. But I think that just the fact that you've stopped measuring altogether, you're not measuring them at the time of entrance when that has started happening now and not measuring as an ongoing part of, you know, them, when they are in the education system is is where we need to change. That, you know, measurement think, is not for penalizing. I think this is a debate that is uh, not teacher going to... No teacher can end up without testing. And those are... I think this is one of those political realities that are very tough to deal with. You know, the teachers are the most important players, and it's uh, very difficult to uh, do certain things. Is there any any uh, summary comment from you? I think we have to wrap up, so we we'll just get one comment from her. No, I think one of the curious things I've noticed is if you look at the large scale nonprofits in this country, you know, it's Agastya, it's Pratham, there's Akansha in Mumbai, there's. Uh, Akshay Patra, even the Deshpande Foundation, if you look at it as an influencer of non-profits, they've all been set up by people who work in, 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 you know, in, in for-profit organizations. And that's, that's something that we need to ponder about. That we have such a rich, vibrant non-profit uh, establishment in this country. We have the largest number of NGOs and we have a phenomenal number of people who want to get into the sector. What is it that we are doing wrong, that we are not able to serve the large number of NGOs, both as donors, both as uh, uh, partners, in, in scaling up a lot of the other NGOs who are doing excellent on the ground work, but seem to be restricted to the small geographies we are in. It's something we really need to ponder on and really the capacity building we need to do um, as donors, as ecosystem builders, I think that is something we really need to think about. Ashwini, I hope you don't mind, but I think we have to close this down. I, I have to make one last uh, comment that she said in terms of the number of uh, NGOs that we have. The problem is that we NGOs are all, uh, you know, frogs in the well. Uh, we, we are inventing the wheel over and over again. I think there is a the time has come where all the NGOs need a common platform and uh, we are able to share our resources and also um, uh, our core strengths. If I am good at something and you are good at something, I think we need to spend more time and uh, energy on that than doing something and we will remain small forever. So we need to have a, maybe uh, a federation of NGOs that may be the going on. Thanks, I actually. Go. So I won't, I won't possibly, I can't possibly summarize what everyone else has said with just repetition. Lots of wonderful points were made. I'll just kind of answer the question that went unanswered. You want me to? And that is kind of a summary thing. You're on. You're here in the sandbox. The topic is scaling by proving. One of the things we do here in the sandbox is we try to give NGOs the opportunity to try out new experiments and see whether they succeed. And the second thing is, the, the mantra here is that you have to be sustainable. So if you, if you run an experiment and it seems to work, you get a lot of support from us. We try to help you scale up and so on and so forth. That's how we work. We chose to work with Akshay Patra and Agastya and Vidya Poshak and a whole bunch of uh, NGOs uh, that some of whom are here, some are, are not. But I think that we have to be thinking of new models. It's very difficult. I, I can I appreciate the kind of challenge you would have because you have the whole system. The rest of us work on the fringes, so we can always come from the from the fringes and say this this thing this part worked, that part didn't work, and be very happy about it. But we haven't run the whole system. So that's a, that's a much bigger deal. But what we're trying to do is work on, work on the margin, experiment. If we find something that works, we try to get incorporated in the big system. And I, I think I'm with Ajit. If you look for the future, look to the future with accelerated learning, and that's what I think Pratham did, does in his correction, you will get accelerated learning. The use of technology, appropriate technology applied in the proper manner can give us tremendous levels. And that's happening not just in K through 12 or K through 10, but in college level and so on. And we are experimenting with that now in Bangalore as well. So thank you very much. I'm sure there'll be many conversations after this in the private space.